Hello, and welcome back to Read the World. My name is Derek Main, and on this channel, I review translated literature. Today's review, The Thief, by Fuminora Nakamura, translated from the Japanese by Satoko Izuzma and Stephen Coates, and this is from Soho Crime. So, a translated noir, and I have spoken before about how much I love noir. The way this came about, I have had some trouble reading. So, I did finish Hurricane Season by Fernando Melcor, translated by Sophie Hughes, Fitzcarraldo Editions, also published by New Directions. But I am saving my review of that because I might do sort of a joint review podcast with somebody specifically on that. So that was a difficult read and a lot of the stuff in my TBR is difficult to read. I wanted escapism, true escapism, because of the circumstances that we're in today. I, I know a lot of people... Um, I, I see that are very serious readers saying, hey, I'm having trouble focusing. I'm having trouble concentrating. I've got a lot of anxiety. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm 100% there with you. Taping from a new spot, as you can see. Um, you know, Every day is kind of be, be different as I make videos during this time because I'm here with my kids and my wife. My wife and I both work, so we're working from home. Uh, I also along with my wife, and now teaching my kids, homeschooling, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, uh, a lot going on, and kind of hard to enjoy literature, which is, uh, for me, rare, or, you know, new. So anyway, I wanted escapism, and noir is where I always go, whenever I want that escapism. And so what I did is, you know, a lot of bookstores are doing some pretty awesome stuff, and Riff Raff Books in Providence, Rhode Island, is co-owned, uh, it's owned by two people, I believe. Tom Robert, who is on the 3% podcast, along with Chad Post of Open Letter, and then his partner, Emma Ramadan, who is a translator, who uh, at least one of her books showed up last year in my top 10, one of the books she translated, in my top 10 books of the year. She's a translator that I like a lot. Well, anyway, they have this great bar, cafe, cafe, coffee shop, bookstore in Providence, Rhode Island. They were asking for folks to make call on some online orders. So I just shot an email and I said, listen, Tom turned me on to Manchette. I love Translate Noir. I'd just like to give you some money and you send me some Translate Noir. And so it was cool because it was all a surprise. Like I had no idea what was coming. And I'm going to save only one of them was Manchette. And it was four books and I hadn't read any of them, which is awesome. And so, um, The Thief is the first one, and it absolutely hit the spot. This is what I wanted when it came to escapism. Uh, it's a great book. Actually, pretty highly literary quality. I mean, one of the things about noir, and I think we're probably in, actually, for a new resurgence of noir because of the political and economic climate that we're now in, you know, as the noir is, it really rages against the system, you know, uh, which is a terrible terminology. I apologize. But it, it is, it upends everything, right? And, it, and it, a lot of times they are underdog stories taking on capitalism. And I, I know that that's not across the board and noir is not like a leftist medium or anything, but there are a lot of noir writers in that space and even those who may not go so far politically as to align themselves with a philosophy or something it, it it's still um, it, it still is shining a light a lot of it on the evils of uh, market-based economy you know because um, of what rises up in sort of a black market response to it. I don't know. I'm having trouble defining that, aren't I? But anyway, uh, the thief has a lot of qualities. Like, let me let me give you an example, real quick. Page 26. Before I even get to the plot, this this will do a better job than than I can even do it explaining it. This is a quote somebody is you know is telling someone in the story. But obviously, if there was no concept of ownership, there'd be no concept of stealing, would there? As long as there's one starving child in the world, all property is theft. 
So that's what I mean. And so here we have sort of a Robin Hood's a stretch. We have a pickpocket. That's who the thief is. And he uh, steals from the rich almost exclusively. And you're going to kind of follow him as he wanders through the subways and department stores and and goes about his craft. And it's really, really fascinating to follow him and to watch him. Uh, but he gets caught up and about midway through there's sort of a shift because some folks need him for a job and he gets kind of put at that next level, maybe two, three levels up that he is not prepared for. And so you're going to start to see the morality equation shift and he's going to have to wrestle with his morality in a very new set of circumstances. It's action-packed, it's a lot of fun to read, you know, where this thing goes and the twists and turns are just classic great noir. When you see on the back, I mean, it's just prize after prize. I'll just mention that it, the winner of the David L. Goodis Award for noir fiction, you know, there you go. Like that's, to me, obviously huge. Um, LA Times Book Prize was a, a finalist for Wall Street Journal Best Fiction Selection. I mean, this is a, a big time book, a great book, you know, uh, a lot of fun to read. So. A lot of the, a lot of the commentary, especially in the beginning parts, as you're kind of following him around, is about the feeling that one has, like as they're stealing, and I think it kind of romanticizes it some. It's not romanticizing in a negative sense. I just mean that it is looking at it from a romantic point of view. And let me let me give you a quick sense. Like on page 59, someone who's leading them to a different crime is t telling them, pay close attention to everything that happens during the robbery and enjoy it. You're gonna get a taste of something that most people will never experience in their whole lives. That quick, simple sentence is what I want to speak on briefly because as you're following him around the subways and you're following him pickpocket and then even in this bigger crime, you are going to get this heightened sense of reality and, and, and this, as I said, kind of romantic notion of what it is to steal. So I know a little bit about this. Um, confession time. So when I was in my um, teens and whatnot and I was in punk rock bands and living in lots of communal arrangements and stuff like that, I was a shoplifter. I stole um, from not people. Uh, in this case, I stole from grocery stores and places like that. I got caught. I'm much older now and fully reformed. But I do remember that feeling, okay? And one thing that I would note, and what we would do is we would go into a grocery store and we'd bring in our own plastic bag, so say 10 to 12 of them, and then you would go through the grocery store and just shop like normal, okay? And then you'd go into an aisle, usually like the health food aisle at that time was, there was nobody ever there, um, and you'd bag up your own groceries, put them in the cart, and then you just walk out and it looks to everybody in the world like you're just leaving you know no one's like paying attention to who who was here or there it's a big grocery store right did that okay got caught once and that was the end of it but i think that part about like getting caught once and that being the end of it for me and for a lot of us but it wasn't for everyone and it, it's an important point because that's kind of when you decide like how you are going to interact with crime for me, I had no moral issue with crime. In fact, still don't, truthfully. Um, I have moral issues with some crimes, but not all crime, not, not crime on the whole, right? Um, but I, very selfishly, but also, you know, survival, uh, did not want to face any consequences for it. So to me, the balance, like, it wasn't worth it, okay? Because I, uh, while I did not feel any moral negativity about stealing from a grocery store, I certainly did not want to have to face the consequences. And that part 
sucked for me, okay? But other people, that was fine. That was something that they accepted. And people that I knew, still know. Well, that's how the thief is. Like, the thief accepts it, and that excitement part that he feels, and that anyone who's ever stolen, frankly, feels, um, it's, it's heightened almost because of the choice you have made pretty early on, you know, to be that person in society and to be comfortable as a criminal. That part was really interesting and the psychology of the criminal is really interesting because as I said, he's gonna have to go to another level. I said I had no moral issue with crime. Yeah, no moral issue stealing from like a huge corporate grocery store once a week. No, I don't, okay? But that's one singular crime. And there's a lot of others that, of course, you're going to have huge moral issues with. And he's going to be put in those positions, literally put there, placed there. I mean, a puppeteer is going to come along and, and make his people do his work kind of thing under, under threat. So anyway, it's interesting to see that dichotomy of, at first, someone who is very comfortable with his own skin, made this choice, and is fine going this path. Um, towards what that then can mean. Like, it's almost like a gateway drug, right? Like, it's like, okay, fine. If you're okay being a criminal, then here's someone even way more criminal who is way more comfortable with it. And and you see that, that, that morality itself can be a slippery slope. And maybe not having a moral problem with something like that um, can lead you into the wrong hands, so to speak. The last thing I want to read from here, page 133, is ultimately what I found to be one of the broader themes of the work. And this again is somebody speaking. This is the puppeteer, as it were. Old-fashioned threats are the most effective, he said with a laugh. You and Nimi are both pretty dumb. Even though you've chosen this lifestyle, you still seek attachments. That's the height of stupidity. You'd be much better off if you were truly free. The only reason Nimi didn't run away before the robbery was you. So what about that as a theme? Don't let yourself become attached to anything that you will not walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you spot the heat coming around the corner. That is from the movie Heat, an absolute all-time classic great movie. And Val Kilmer responds in that moment but for me, the sun rises and sets with her. Val Ke Kilmer will lose because of that feeling and that statement and because of that attachment. And ironically, De Niro, who is saying that in that moment, who says, do not allow yourself to have any attachments, nothing that you will not walk out on in 30 seconds flat when you, if you spot the heat coming around the corner, he will develop an attachment and that will be his downfall. And honestly, that seems sort of true of a criminal enterprise at some point. You know, if it is just you, and if it is just, if you were only, if you were only answerable to yourself, then that flexibility allows you to move in the way you need to move in the darkness of society, you know. But if you have an attachment, you have a weak point. And the thief here does develop an attachment. So this is a good book. My next couple of reviews might actually end up being noir. Uh, yeah, usually I'm able to pop up here and show you the next book, but uncertain times, folks. So I don't know. You know, I don't know what I'm going to read. When I shut this off, I'm going to, you know... Go teach my kids, do some fractions, something I'm terrible at. Thankfully, my eight-year-old can teach me. Make myself a pot of tea, see where the day goes. Um, and uh, planning out what I'm reading next is a lot harder. But this right here was a nice diversion and distraction. It is going to take me at least three hours to figure out how to edit the first and the second part of this and make it not awful. So as you're watching this, just know that I, I bled for you. Thanks, and as always, be good to folks.